You may heard about Meltdown and Spectre. And Spectre 2. And Spectre NG. And Spectre RSB. And Spectre what the fuck. Um, to bring light into this mess, Moritz Lipp, Michael Schwarz, Daniel Gruss, and Claudio Canella will give us an overview of all proposed mitigations and show us that an attacker still can run an attack desperate countermeasurements. Please welcome on stage Moritz, Michael, Daniel and Claudio. We will start our talk with a video and for that we will go off stage. <laughs> <laughs> Can we turn the lights off? <laughs> okay. Welcome. Welcome to my little talk about uh, performance of computers. I like fast computers. Who else likes fast computers? Who bought a new computer this year? Yes. And we want all our computers to be super fast. And of course, we used in our talk, we have some materials from other people and we acknowledge them here. And we also um, present results here, research results, where we collaborated with a lot of people. And of course, this was funded by uh, different parties. For the full acknowledgement, see the papers. But I will start with performance is awesome. And this is what this talk is about. Performance is awesome. And for me, when I was a bit younger, uh, the Pentium Pro uh, 1995, this was quite awesome because this machine had 150 megahertz. Quite nice. And uh, it was the first Intel processor that uh, was RISC emulating CISC, which is quite nice uh, because um, this allows you to do something which I will uh, have in the next point. But also it had a 256 kilobyte level 2 cache integrated into the CPU. So it was not separately on the main board, but in the processor itself. Very nice. And branch prediction. Bran we love branch prediction. And out-of-order execution, this is what we get here from these RISC emulating sys out-of-order execution. Now we can schedule small bits of uh, code on the actual processor. So the future also is going to be fast because we are getting faster and faster, more and more performance. For instance, Apple in the new iPhone introduced uh, 16 kilobyte pages as the standard page size, the minimum page size. And that allows them to introduce 128 kilobyte level 1 caches. That's larger than the a level one caches in Intel processors. So caches, super nice. Oh, Daniel, Daniel, not so fast. I'm Morris, vector of the past. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And probably, you see, you only want performance, but that's not everything that comes with it. So for instance, imagine a program, no bugs at all, no vulnerabilities, but apparently this does not mean that the software that is executed is actually safe. Because information can leak from the underlying hardware, from your performance improvements that you celebrate here. Not if you don't have any software bugs, right? That's not the case. Because you can exploit this leakage through side channels. For instance, you can look at the power consumption or the execution time of your algorithm. Yeah, sure. Then you know that it consumed a bit more power. What do you learn from that? I mean, whatever. A lot, as we will see. Humbug. And also CPU caches. But more importantly, before we dive into those topics, is to understand the difference between architecture and microarchitecture. All of us know instruction set architecture like ARM v8, x86, and this is just an abstract model of a computer. But actually, there is an interface between hardware and the software. And how those instructions are implemented is defined by the microarchitecture. And this is where things get interesting. Yeah, yeah, this is what I made with the uh, RISC and CISC stuff, right? Yeah, because we all know AMD, Athlon, Ryzen, Core i7, Xeon, and so on, and they all are a bit different. And they are quite fast, I like them. Yeah, that's true. But this also is a problem sometimes. And all of them have many elements in order to improve performance, in order to achieve different tasks efficiently. So they contain multiple microarchitectural elements. For instance, caches and buffers, different predictors like the branch predictor Daniel mentioned, and so on. And the nice thing is... They, they make everything faster. That's the nice <laughs> thing. <laughs> and they are transparent for the programmer, so he yes. doesn't notice at all. He runs the same program on a different microarchitecture and everything is faster. But since everything is faster in some cases, we have timing optimizations and therefore timing differences. And as we've learned earlier, those timing differences are side channel leakage yeah, yeah, and yeah, we and can exploit it. But no one knows what you can learn with that, right? Oh, a lot. And actually, sure. I also optimized something during the Christmas holidays because I needed to cook something. And cooking is nicer. So I wanted to cook something. I prepared the board, everything to cut. And then I figured out, damn, I'm missing the vegetables. I'm missing the tomatoes, the bell peppers. So I need to go to the supermarket. And this takes a lot of time. And then I come back. Now I have my tomatoes and the bell peppers so I can start cutting. And then I figure out I wanted to cook some spinach. So what do I do? I go again to the supermarket. This takes a lot of time. Everything, everyone is hungry. So this sucks. But then I can continue cooking. So what I did, I invented something, and it's amazing. Because what I did, I used things you do in the processes and apply them to everyday life for cooking. So I invented a food cache, and it's amazing. Because now I can store everything there, and I do not have to go to the supermarket again. Did you just explain processor caches by cooking? Yeah, because it's relevant. Yeah. Humbug. No. So actually, since I'm the specter of the past, I've been here two years ago. And I've told you something then in a different talk about x86 microarchitecture. And some of the part you didn't listen to, apparently. So I will repeat. So for CPU caches, imagine you have a variable i and you want to access it. So it's not in the cache, so you have a cache miss, and then you have to do a lookup in the main memory. And this takes some time, you send a request there, the main memory will respond, and the value will be loaded into the cache. So the second time, when you want to use this variable, it's already in the cache. So if we have a cache miss, we need to do a DRAM access, so everything is slow. But on the other hand, if we do not need a DRAM access, because the value is already in the cache, it's fast. And it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, and it makes everything better. Yeah, but don't you see a problem here? I don't see a problem here. It's so, getting faster and more efficient. That's true. But imagine if an attacker can measure that. He just has a high-resolution timer, measures the access time to a memory address, and if it's in the cache, it's pretty fast. 
But on the other hand, if it's not in the cache, it's much slower, as we've seen. So what an attacker can do, he can figure out a threshold in between to distinguish if a variable has been loaded into the cache or not. And he can build powerful attacks with that. For instance, the flush and reload attack. Imagine the address space of an attacker on the left and the address space of the victim on the right, and they use some shared memory, like a shared library. This means an address from the shared library is cached for both the attacker and the victim. What the attacker now can do, he can use an unprivileged instruction on x86, the seal flush instruction, to remove this data from the cache. This means the data is not in the cache for both the victim and the attacker, of course. Now, the victim is scheduled. He can either access the address, in this case he does, which will transparently load back the value into the cache. And what the attacker can do now, he can again access the measure, uh, measure the access time of this variable and figure out if the victim has accessed the address or not. And this is very nice as an attacker, because you can build powerful attacks with that. Really, really, what can yeah. you build with that? So, for instance, what you could do, by just looking at cache hits and misses, you can leak AES keys from the cache. Th that's just academic attacks, right? Can't really do that. You can also look at keystroke timings with the cache, or build a covered channel using the cache to transmit some data from one Android application to the other. For so, so the academics say? Yeah. And you can do sure. this in the browser, in the cloud, in trusted execution environments like Trust. You, you can't Netflix. prove that it actually works. Oh, I do, because I have a demo with me. So here we see a Samsung Galaxy S6, and the victim opens his favorite messenger and tries to send a message. And the spy application, which does not need any permissions and privileges on the system, will just use the cache to figure out whenever the victim typed something. And he can distinguish between alphabet letters, the space, the backspace, figure out the length of the words. Seriously? Yeah. This, this is just metadata. You're interrupting <sighs> my talk on performance for metadata. Go off stage. Oh, come on. No, go off stage. I, I want to continue with my talk on fast computers. Really? So, I talked about the Apple, and uh, there are actually more interesting features. For instance, Intel, um, since a long time is improving more and more on out-of-order parallelism. And they also announced something new there. And to understand that, I want to explain um, out-of-order execution. And that's, again, because Moritz already talked about cooking. Maybe we should also talk about cooking. We all cook, uh, make uh, cookies during the Christmas holidays or before the Christmas holidays. And usually, we want them to look like this. And uh, usually what we start with looks like this, and there's some way in between. And usually it involves stirring everything and forming small balls, and then pressing them flat and putting them in the oven. And afterwards you want to dip them into chocolate. But the problem is, if you wait until the cookies are already done, you're losing some time. So actually you can save some time by now, while the cookies are in the oven, uh, preparing the hot chocolate and then dipping them into the hot chocolate afterwards when they are ready and the hot chocolate is ready so everything's perfect and everything's faster. I saved a lot of time here. So this is great. And we can do the same thing in computers. Oh, Daniel, Daniel. Don't you listen to the specters of the past? It's me, Michael, specter from the present. So with that, we get another whole lot of problems here. Don't you see, you're kind of opening the box of Pandora with that. That's, that's not good what you're doing out of order here. It's, it's again a problematic performance optimization. Imagine you burn the cookies in the oven and then you can't dip them in the chocolate. So if someone sees the chocolate you have, they know you were trying to bake cookies which you apparently screwed up. Really? You're trying to explain me that they learn that I try to bake cookies? Yes. That's, again, metadata, right? Oh, no, it's, it's quite more than metadata. We can do a lot more with that. Let's look at it on a computer science level. So we have a simple program here that has some variables and calculates the diagonal and the area of some geometric figure. And if you look at that, we go through it line by line, usually. But the computer could do an optimized variant of that by figuring out what the dependencies are of the code lines 
and what it could paralyze. So this is just thing, what I explained, right? Yeah, the same thing you do with cookies, the computer does with code, or we illustrate it here with code. In, if we actually look at the hardware level, it's not the code lines, but we go down to instruction level. So it's basically more a kitchen in your CPU. Um, this is the out of order execution, and it's, it looks a bit more complicated than your kitchen, and there's a lot of more things in parallel. So you have your instruction stream from the application going in. The, all the instructions are fetched and then decoded in the front end. And then we dispatch it to the back end with some scheduling there. And then we have a lot of execution units that can do a lot of things, like an, an oven. And they are processed by the individual execution units. I, I was about to explain all this in my performance talk. What, 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 do, I, what do you want to tell me here? Yes. So you still don't see a problem with that. It's, it's a nice performance optimization. I agree with that. But still, there's a problem. I did an experiment. Look at my code here. So I, I wrote two lines of code. Really? Yes. You're accessing a null pointer? Yes, it's a problem. Are you expecting this to do anything useful? You expected to Did crash, you try right? that? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, first I tried to compile it. My compiler was not so happy about it. What a surprise. Um, my static code analyzer wasn't happy either. It's a, it's a dereference of a null pointer. It will crash here. So you said the same. It will crash after the first line. Second line, this access to the memory will never be executed. So that's what, what you think, what the compiler thinks. But I tried it, of course. And what happens? I do a flush and reload attack, like the specter of the past told you, and I can see that the memory access actually happened. So this line was executed, although it should have crashed before. But that's fine. It's just running in parallel, and this does not leak any information. So you say this is out of order execution, and it's fine. Yeah. And I can't abuse that for anything. Right. So. It's not a problem that they leave kind of traces. If you do things out of order and you leave traces, like chocolate for the burnt cookies, it's not a problem. When we can see them in the microarchitecture and all these elements, then we give them a name, call them transient executions. So we have something to talk about. And then we can see this execution of your out of order instructions. And if you now think about how it actually works, if we dereference an address, if you load something from the memory, then we try to read an address, then we have the memory management unit translating the addresses, checking these bits, the permission bits, whether we can actually read that. If the permission bits are fine, everything is okay, and we get the data from this address. But if we don't have permission to read that, for example, because we try to read privileged memory, the memory management unit tells us, nope, and kills the application. So we're gone. That's what's supposed to happen. But and, let's and that's what happens here, right? That's what happens here. But let's get back to my experiment and combine that. So before that, I had this null pointer dereference, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But if I replace the access to the null pointer with an access to a kernel address, some privileged memory I'm not supposed to read. It will still crash. It, it will crash. I agree. But then I use this data, which I do not get, according to you, and use that as an index to an array and access the memory there. And then I check whether any part of the array is actually cached, whether I can see any access to this array. And if I do that, huh, I get a cache hit at exactly this array index, which corresponds to the data which I was not supposed to read. Yeah, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> because the permission check. But, but uh, this is, I mean, you're, sho you're showing, you're showing plots order. here, and this is from some academic paper. This does not work in, 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 in practice, right? Oh, if, if we do that, we can actually read data from the kernel. We can read any data that's stored currently in memory. And it's even quite fast. This is not the fastest, but I can read all your secrets. Your browser history, for example. Okay, you okay. don't like that, I guess. Yeah, this is quite bad, but um, I think we can do something against that, right? Yeah, so that's what we call meltdown. And you agree, this is actually quite bad. 
So, two years ago I showed you some other attacks which you can look up in the talk which we linked earlier. But the issue is quite obvious. What you're doing is you're accessing a kernel address while you're running in user space. So obviously this is a huge problem. So why don't we just take those addresses and remove them if we do not need them? Because the user accessible check in hardware, which you explained to us, obviously does not work and is not reliable in every case if you can mount such an attack. But Daniel didn't believe that. He will learn eventually. So how can we mitigate meltdown? We just start unmapping the kernel while we are running in user space. And then the kernel addresses are no longer present. And if they are no longer present, no one can access them. Because the memory which is not mapped cannot be accessed at all. And actually, this is what we implemented in our Kaiser batch, which is now ported to Linux, Windows, macOS in a much better fashion. But basically, what it does is imagine you have the user space on the left with the applications and the kernel on the right. And you imagine this process isolation as a huge wall, and no application can grab through this wall to access the data. But with Meltdown, they can. So what we do now is by changing the way the operating system is working, when we are running in the kernel mode, the user space is there. But when we are running in user mode, and the attacker tries to mount the same attack, punching through the wall, nothing is behind it. And this is nice, because the meltdown doesn't work. So. OK, yeah, but then this problem is solved, and we can think of other things, maybe performance. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This just fixes the meltdown vulnerability. But actually, there's more similar thing than that. So okay. can you think about virtual machines? Virtual machines? Yes. Sure. So we are talking about native code. But there are no real machines. So no real problems, right? Yeah. yeah well, we, we still have virtual machines, and we use them all the time. And of course, because we use them all the time, we have a lot of performance optimizations for virtual machines, like for the address translation, so that we can do a more efficient address translation from virtual machines to actual physical memory. And that perfectly makes sense. And that makes sense to make it faster. But again, we might have a small problem here. So if we, for example, are in a virtual machine, like VirtualBox, and then we have some page table that references some physical page, and it's present, of course, then we can dereferences and access the memory there. We have this small step in between so that these addresses in the virtual machine are translated to actual physical addresses. And these physical addresses then reference some physical page, and we get the data from the physical page, and of course we do a lookup with the physical address so that we can check whether it's already in the cache, the performance optimization, and get the data from that faster. But what happens if we try to dereference an address in a virtual machine which is not present? Probably it won't access anything, which makes sense. Yes, then we don't have to do this guest host translation thing. And what some processes might do is then they just do the cache lookup, which they shouldn't do, and it, because they don't have a physical address, with the virtual address. And the virtual address is controlled by the virtual machine, so by the user. So they can basically read everything from the level one cache. Yeah, that's also quite bad, but Intel actually said they fixed that. They said they fixed that. So what are you still doing on stage here? Go, go away. So let me continue about performance. This, is about, this talk is about performance, and I will get back to this slide. Uh, so Intel introduced more ports, more parallelism, and um, larger reorder buffers, and this is all great because it makes our computers more eff effective, more efficient, and uh, faster. Uh, so 
Let's look at other vendors. Maybe AMD. AMD introduced a new perceptron-based prediction mechanism for branches. This is also quite nice. And to understand how branch prediction actually works, we um, again take some analogy um, it, because it's Christmas. Of course, we always thought always thought how Santa manages to uh, have all the Christmas presents ready just in time, right? Because Santa doesn't know who gets a present and who doesn't because there is this uh, pseudo incidents file. And Santa doesn't know who is going to enter pseudo, although he's not in the pseudo as file, one day before Christmas. So what Santa does is, Santa of course wants to get rid of bottlenecks and have more efficiency there. So Santa will use the naughty nice list from the last year. Because probably if you didn't enter pseudo in a, on a machine where you don't have pseudo as right, Writes, you probably won't do it this year, right? That's perfectly ma perfectly makes sense. Yeah. And then the evening before Christmas, Santa checks were the predictions correct. Did the user behave the same way as the year before? And then the user gets a present. And if not, then well, then we have to throw away the wrongly manufactured presents, and we can correct the predictions. Um, in and and. All the predictions that were correct result in free time. That's perfectly fine. Oh no, oh no. I don't know. So many things that can go wrong here. So many things. This is what? about Christmas and presents. What can yes. go wrong? What can go wrong? Have you heard about Spectre? They actually exploit this optimization you invented for Santa. And how do they do that? So talking about now computer science again, because all your Christmas performance thing is, um, let's talk about computer science. So we have some code here, we have some data in memory, and it's an, kind of an array, and we can access some data there, which we can access, which we are allowed to access, like the text before, and then in memory we have something else, like a secret crypto key, which we are not allowed to access for obvious reasons. And the user, can now provide us some index of this memory, which he wants to access to print some string, for example. And then, because we write good code, we check whether this index is actually in the range of this array. And if it's fine, if we can only access the first four characters of this data, then we do some lookup in a lookup table, because, for example, we want to convert it to uppercase. So if the user access some valid characters, it's fine it will be in this index, but you already speculate whether this condition will be true or not. So you have no idea whether this condition will be true, but you just speculate and it's like, I have no idea, but I guess it will be wrong. And in reality, it's correct. So after you actually execute it, you know whether it was correct or not, and you remember that. Like the list from Santa, you remember the outcome of this condition the last time. And next time the user asked for some character, next one is also a valid one. He said, it was OK in the past. This if was true in the past. So it will be true again. Because why would anything change? And spe you speculate that you already do these memory accesses speculatively. And then you see it was correct. We're already done. And we save time. That's great. And you saved a lot of time. So it's fine, as long as the user is a good user and doesn't try to do anything illegal. Then the user says, let's try to read something I'm not supposed to read, like this key here. And the user provides an, an index that's out of bounds and would re reference some of these secret values there. You said, in the past, oh, this if condition was always true, so it will be true again. Speculate, do a memory access again. But now with this data, which the user is not allowed to access, already do the memory access, we can do the flush and reload again and learn a secret value. And then you say, oh, pff, what's wrong, whatever, execute the else branch, discard everything else. But the microarchitectural state already changed, so you leak the values from it just by predicting a simple if condition. And then it continues and the user can read basically arbitrary memory. You update the prediction a bit, but you say, in most cases, it was true, so it will always be true. It's fine. Sure, but who would write code like that? Yeah, no one does bounce checking for array accesses. Who does that, right? And that's not the only thing you try to predict. So if 
our CPUs try not to only predict if conditions, but also calls. For example, if you write C++, you have some classes, some virtual functions, and then you have some object with a function, and you have an animal, and it's a, it's a bird, and it has a move function, and it could fly or swim, but usually a bird flies. So you predict something. Think of a duck. Yeah, but usually, not all the time. And then you execute the fly function. And you, so the CPU remembers that, and next time you call the move functionality, it costs, it speculates on the fly. But if we then change the instance of the object to something else, like a fish, and a fish usually doesn't fly, then you still speculate on the fly, because it was the same in the past. And you have basically a speculative type confusion here. And something was executed with the wrong data of some instance of an object. And because this is still not enough, we have more predictions in our CPU to predict more things, like returns. You have some victim, some attacker, and the victim has some secret value, like a secret crypto key, and attackers nothing. And if the victim calls some function with some short running code, and the attacker calls the same function with some long running code, then we have this return stack buffer where the CPU remembers where the last call came from. And now the first uh, code that will return is the victim because that's the short running function, but it will take the address speculatively from the return stack buffer and return into the attacker's code. And then the attacker can again use speculatively the secrets from the victim because we're in the wrong control flow here. Until it sees, oh no, what's wrong? Just discard everything. But we leaked all the values through the microarchitectural elements. Yes, and all the time you're explaining this with data and this memory access, this is all just the same, like meltdown spectre, this is oh, all no, the same. Oh, right? no, 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 that's not the same. Come on. There are, there are different attacks and there's different problems in our CPUs. So if you're talking about spectre attacks, we have some operation here, and at some point we predict something. The CPU predicts something. And it, it predicts the control flow or some data flow depending on what kind of spectre attack we're talking about. And this all happens then transiently, so it doesn't know whether it's correct or not. It might discard it. And at some point, the operations retire, so they are actually executed and done. And at this point, the CPU knows whether the prediction was correct or not and can discard it or keep it, so it saved a lot of time. This is spectre. But for meltdown, we have also some operation, and another operation that accesses data, and another operation with a data dependency. So it needs the data from the previous instruction. And this is fine. But if this second instruction has some exception, because it was not allowed to use this data, then everything that happens afterward is a transient execution. It should never happen, because that's not supposed to happen Nothing is supposed to happen after an exception. But an exception cannot be raised immediately, but only at retirement. So the correct thing would be to discard the data of the instruction and give the data-dependent operation just some dummy data, like null or random. But if you optimize this step out of discarding the value, you get the meltdown. And then you can leak the privileged data. So there are, there are quite a few differences okay, here. Okay, so, so there are two vulnerabilities, Spectre and Meltdown, and Intel already fixed them, we know, and the other is fixed with the software patch. So I can now continue with my talk on performance, right? Can I? Uh, you can try. <laughs> okay, let's continue with performance. So um, AMD, this prediction-based mechanisms, they are really quite nice. Oh, Daniel, you still haven't learned anything from the specters of the past really and the present. Really? Another ghost? Yes. So let me, because you haven't learned anything now, let me, the specter of the future, tell you what will happen if you don't stray from your path. So you say you like optimization. What will normally happen, or you need normally do, to um, update the, the access rights of a page? You would have to... Uh, normally, you would have to um, 
um, to um, do a context um, switch, but that's yeah, fine. Yeah, right? you need to do a context switch, but you also have to modify the page table entry, flush the TLB, and that is slow. You hate slow, right? Okay. So yeah. We have a, a new technology called Intel MPK, Memory Protection Keys. In the protection key, you can assign a protection key to a group of pages. You can use the four bits in the PTE that were not used so far. And that allows you to do a quick update because you can do it for a whole range of addresses. OK, that's nice. Sounds nice, right? Yeah, it's but a, what, yeah I like but, performance. But what happens if we see the same problem that we see before? We, because we can also see meltdown even with MPK. Because the protection keys are lazily enforced. So the data that we protect with it is actually forwarded to the, um, to the transit instructions. And as the spec of the past has told you, you can observe the value in the cache. Ah, that's bad. It's bad, right? Yeah. So what if and a different thing is we have we all perform bound control. We have, um, and, but it would be nice to have something that we that would do it automatically. So we have an instruction for that. Yeah. X eighty six gives us an instruction like that, and if we exceed the accepted range, we get a bound range exceeded exception. But the, we also have here the problem that the data is used in the in transient execution, and we can again use flush and reload to observe the value in the cache. So this is two new meltdown variants? Yes, oh. these are two new meltdown variants. And if you remember, um, AMD always claimed that they are not affected by meltdown. Well, they are not affected, right? Well, let's look at this. They said back then, OK, we are not affected by meltdown. So if you're running Linux on uh, an AMD processor, uh, we just disable everything that is related to, Ka to Kaiser. And they said this back in 2017. And um, the problem is here now, this new version of Meltdown is actually the first Meltdown attack on AMD. So you cannot escape Meltdown by just switching the vendor. And we can see here that you cannot even switch to ARM or something else because we have two new variants here with Meltdown and PK and BR that work on Intel and with PR that works on AMD. And we have also observed so many different um, or tested so many different versions with different faults that we do not, that do not work, either on Intel ARM or AMD. But, but uh, are we certain that they don't work or might they work in the future? We are fairly certain. So we tested them, but who knows? Maybe our experiments failed. Okay. We are still human. Wow. Or you are still human. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's talk about defenses. We can categorize meltdown defenses in two groups. The first one is we try to eliminate the, the data that is architecturally access, uh, inaccessible, shouldn't be ac uh, accessible in the, in the microarchitectural level. So if we can't, cannot do that, we are fine. The different thing is we can simply prevent the occurrence of faults. If there's no fault, we don't get meltdown. And the specter of the, of the present also told you about foreshadow, or meltdown P, as we call it. And you said that Intel claims, well, that solved everything. But let's look at how they try to solve it. Um, we can simply clear the physical address field, because if we don't have the address field of the unmapped PTE, then we cannot read data from the, from the cache, because it doesn't access anymore. And when we switch the protection to main, we can simply flush the L1, because if there's no data in there, what can we leak? So that's the future, apparently. But we are still in the past, yes, in the because present, right? I or doubt that this actually works. Oh, oh, it, it does. So, so, so what you're saying is you can, so first of all, is your system fully updated? I have an updated Ubuntu 18.4, I guess. OK. And uh, so my software is up to date. And I have this virtual box running. And I, I implemented this foreshadow exploit. I really like that. And we were talking about center. And center, of course, has this nice naughty list. But it's a huge list. Everyone does sudo without being rude, right? So he needs uh, a nice naughty list manager <laughs> uh, to, 
to keep track of, of all the, the nice and, and naughty people. And, well, and now I want to use my virtual machine. It's just a virtual machine. It can't escape. If we have an escape from virtual box, that's really bad. We're just using this foreshadow to read the password entry from this nice naughty list manager in real time here. So because with foreshadow, we have seen before, we can read everything that's in the cache, so what is currently used. And this nice naughty list manager has some nice features because it gives me some address where I can actually read that so I don't have to look through the whole cache. Because and then you want, time to, for that. you want to read the password that center enters. Yes. But we don't know the password. We don't know the password. Yeah, that's a flaw, right? We didn't so. think that through. <laughs> Does anyone know the password of center? Any ideas what the password could be? Sudo? Sudo, okay. Okay, let's, let's see. Oh, I can in, in real time leak it here in my virtual box, whatever center enters. <laughs> so I can do whatever I want, can spy on everything. So yeah, future might fix that, but we are still in the present where this is not fixed. Wait, why is this not fixed? It should be fixed, right? Oh no. Yeah, it should be fixed, but it has so high performance overhead that nobody actually does that. Now I lost. <laughs> you lost the presentation, I, I think. I lost the presentation. Yeah. That's not good. But we can look a bit more at the demo. It is also very nice. It's, an, it's a nice center. It, we, we need some Jeopardy sounds here. <laughs> Yes, that's good. Louder. <laughs> oh no, again the wrong one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now we're at the beginning again, in case you missed something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will start from, from the beginning. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> yeah, click somewhere there. That will be fine. I think it's just... Oh no. Come on. Yeah. Oh, nearly. So a short recap. <laughs> Can't do it now. Fast forward. We need more performance optimization. It's a bit slow here. It's still. Oh, you're already too far. Oh, no. oh no, no, I'm too. F oh no. Okay, here, there, here, there. No. Yeah. Ah, it's yeah. slow. We need more Perfect. performance. Apparently. Okay, but now you can leave the stage. <laughs> okay. So let's continue. So we have, we have this transient cause. We can classify all these attacks that we call transient execution attacks sim with some, some simple questions. If we have a predictor, we have spectre. If we have a fault, we have meltdown. And then hmm, um, uh, we already saw these versions. But what if, if, we, what is if we can mistrain the prediction in a different place? So far, we've seen that we, uh, that we mistrain it in the same place. With Spectre V1, yeah. Yes, yeah. but what is if we can mistrain it in a different address? But, but why would I do that? Because it allows an attack to, to target something else. That's bad. Or, even worse, what is if we, because the branch prediction state is shared, what is if we can do it from a different place or externally at in another process, for instance? Or on the operating system. Yeah. Oh. So we have these new mistraining strategies. And we can we analyze them. So we have, for Intel, we were able to show that our new mistraining strategies worked very well. For ARM, some worked, some did not yet work. And for AMD, the same as for ARM. OK, but with all these variants, isn't there anything where we can say something like, we can eliminate all the out-of-place attacks or something? Well, or all the attacks in general? Well, we have an optimal solution. We call it the trilling template. If you trill at exactly the, no, the no, indicated... Do you, have any, do, I, do you have any serious countermeasures? OK, if you want serious countermeasures, let's talk about serious countermeasures. Just with, as with Meltdown, we can categorize it into three different categories. We can mitigate or reduce the accuracy of our cover channels so we can observe the data. We can mitigate the or abort speculation. Or 
we can ensure that our secret data cannot be reached at all, because it cannot be reached, it cannot be leaked. And we can see here, we have so many different defenses. Why, why is this so empty? I mean, are we, is this completely lost? Or? No, because so, most of the defenses don't consider all microarchitectural elements. And if you, don't, if you don't consider it, then it might still be able to be exploited just by using a different, um, uh, just by using a different microarchitectural yeah. element. So For site isolation, we saw a lot of boxes colored. Yes, before. we yeah. saw a lot of them boxes colored. And what is site isolation? Well, we execute each site in its own process. This limits the amount of data that, we can, that is exposed. And so far, it is the default in Chrome 67, and Firefox is working on it. So you're basically reducing Spectre to Meltdown, and if I have a Meltdown defense, then it's secure. OK. Yes. Yeah, sounds reasonable. And then we can look at a different mitigation. Let's look at serialization. If we insert instructions that simply stop the speculation, then we should be fine. And we insert it after every bounce check, but this disables speculative execution. And we have this on x86, uh, x86 and on ARM. Another more serious um, attempt to stop Spectre is in VisiSpec. If we make the, the transient load invisible at all, how can we leak data? By simply using a speculative buffer, and if we have the correct prediction, we load the data into the cache, and if it is wrong, we just throw it away. But this is in hardware. We don't have this that in hardware. This is in hardware, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't install that in my computer now. No, yeah. you can't. So how do we have some analysis of that? Well, we have so many different versions, and we, analyze, uh, we looked at them for all vendors, and we can see that, for instance, in VisiSpec, SafeSpec, we can theoretically argue that they do not work. In others, like site isolation, does not work in all cases. But, and but it works in some cases. It works in some cases, okay. yes. So that's nice. So we have the, this for Intel, ARM, and AMD. Looks all pretty similar. Yes, they're pretty similar. And we can also have, or we have another problem with that, because some... Um, uh, because they, 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 they only defend against some of the cases. That's quite bad, right? So I have to combine them? Yes, you need a combination of different mitigations, mm -hmm. and each one costs performance. So with this, we have seen in recent weeks that STIBP, for instance, has been introduced, but because of the performance impact, it was thrown out again. And with Linux 4.20, it can be enabled, but it is off by default. So how much use do you have of a defense that is not enabled? Let's return to our, to our classification. We have, we have already seen this part. We have discussed the mistraining strategies. And in previous work, we have, or we have seen these versions. So there are some obvious gaps here, are there? Yes, because these are our new mistraining strategies, where we showed that these work as well. And in Meltdown, we have the same thing. We have seen some that work, and we have those that we showed that did not work, some that we already knew, and some that we did not know yet, but who did not work, and those that works. OK. So, wow, that were many, many attacks. But how did we end up here? I think but I'm outnumbered. <laughs> yeah, there are more ghosts than you. So apparently, we have ignored microarchitectural attacks for a long, long time. I mean, two years ago, I told you about some attacks, and nothing has been done. And the things are, we showed attacks on crypto. Yeah, but the software should be fixed. That was, everybody said that. So fix the software, don't care about the side channels. But how about the tax on ASLR? ASLR is dead anyways. Who uses ASLR for a useful countermeasure? It's, it's broken anyway. We don't care about that. I use ASLR. But how about trusted execution environments? I mean, attacks on... SGX or Trust Zone, where I say I put my software in and everything is secure. Well, those, they are, they are not part of the threat model, so you can't consider those. Uh, I wouldn't say so. And how about Rowhammer? I mean, some of those attacks improve the Rowhammer attack, and you can just flip arbitrary bits, get rude. 
well, those only affect some cheap modules. So but, the pre but the prevalence study said 80%. Do you say 80% is some cheap modules? Yes. <laughs> I, I think, I think I, I, so I, I realize more and more that for years we solely optimized for performance. And maybe this was not all good. I mean, you were standing here and saying performance, performance, performance. Now? I can't remember that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, apparently, optimizations always come with a cost. So on the one hand, you're optimizing something which makes sense, as we've seen with all those optimizations that we've seen. But on the other hand, in some of those corner cases, you leak some information and that can be crucial. And some of the mitigations, as we have seen, we need to combine a lot of them and we get a lot of performance overhead and it costs so much performance that we even lose more performance than we actually gain with the feature we implemented in the first hand. So that's also a huge problem here. And because so many of the defenses don't work or can be bypassed, we, need, we learn that we, or we know that the transient execution attacks will keep us busy for a very long time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Moritz, Michael, Daniel, and Claudio. I think we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So please ask your questions. There's microphone number one, two, three, four, and five. And I hope I see the signal angel. Yes. So microphone number one, please. Thank you, and thanks for the talk. Um, you hinted at some point that you can turn off prediction. So if you have a check like if then else and uh, want to get rid of prediction, there's something you could do, but you didn't say what. So what can you do to get rid of prediction there? So you mean in software? Yeah. Um, so you can introduce instructions that where the processor won't speculate across them. Uh, because the processor can't. For instance, undefined instructions, for instance, CPU ID, there are instructions where the processor goes be does not go beyond. Um, also, okay. Intel initially said uh, you should use something like Elfense because the processor won't issue um, memory loads after an Elfense uh, during speculative execution, similar with CSDB on ARM. Okay, thank you. Cool. Microphone number... Two, I think. Yeah. How much, uh, how much slower are the processors after a software or a hardware patch? Roundabout. So that really depends on what countermeasure you are enabling and what workload you have on your computer. So for Meltdown, for example, we have this uh, Kaiser batch, also known as KPDI, on Linux, and it really depends on the workload you have. So. On a normal consumer PC where you use some internet and office, you get around below 2% performance overhead, so it's, it's fine. But we have seen performance overheads for uh, computation heavy, like we've seen uh, you worked with uh, Netflix. With uh, Brandon Gregg, yeah. From Netflix, um, yeah. And yeah, they, they if have you have a lot of syscalls per second, that's, that's bad. And it also really depends on the CPU that you have. So if you have a newer Intel CPU with PCID, for instance, you also have a lower overhead than with other CPUs. And for instance, uh, because I mentioned STIBP uh, that was recently dropped, it was reported that that did cost about 20% in of performance. So that's quite a lot. Thanks. I think microphone number four has a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you, um, well, you only spoke about reading data, but what about writing data, maybe not in the main memory, but in, only in the cache? Data that would be used after by, by the kernel or another process? So there's one specter attack where you have like a speculative buffer, buffer overflow where you could overwrite the return address 
and this is, will be executed speculatively, so you can do that, but we haven't seen anything where you persistently write the data. For Rowhammer, for instance, you can flip a bit in the DRAM, and this bit flip will be persistent. It, or it can be persistent. It can, yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks, and I heard the signal angel has a question from the interwebs. Are there any architectures that aren't vulnerable to the art attack types you mentioned? Yes, so, so for ARM there are some architectures which are not vulnerable, for instance, to Meltdown. Some of the custom cores of some companies, like the Samsung core, which they have, it's vulnerable. For ARM itself, it's only the A73, I guess? 75. Ah, uh, 75, sorry. And also some older ones which do not have branch prediction at all. So obviously they are not affected. Yeah, if you don't have, if the processor doesn't have the feature, uh, usually it's very small processors. Or they won't the embedded be. processors. Yeah. They usually don't have uh, branch prediction or out of order execution. Yes. So they are fine. But there was a paper from, uh, um, from uh, Jo van Burg and uh, he showed that even for a very small uh, microcontroller, um, if it has some secure domain, if there is some security sense in the system, there might be uh, meltdown type effects. Thank you. And microphone number five, please. Yes. Uh, has any of these attacks actually been seen in the wild? I don't know if we would be the first to know that. I think you would have to ask that someone else. So we haven't heard of any attacks in the wild. Thanks. And microphone number one, please. Um, sorry if it's a stupid question, but you showed those uh, circles, squares, and stars in some slides. Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> well, what do those stand for? Well, um, if it's a square, it means that if it's full, then we can theoretically argue, okay, this defense works. If it's empty, then we theoretically argue it does not work. If it's a star, then it's something that we showed in our, in our research paper. Um, uh, if it's, do we have the slide? Right. Um, <laughs> if we have the symbol, it just means this is not applicable for, for this attack. We, we didn't want to put the legend there because it's quite long, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the paper. Uh, you can see the paper and there you will find the full legend. Thank you. But, but empty is basically bad. <laughs> and full is good. And the last question, I think, is for microphone number one. So, so hello, thanks a lot for the talk. So, I'm uh, one of the rare people that run exotic architectures, and I'm running PowerPC at home on a Talos 2 machine. And I was wondering if there is any uh, tool set to test these vulnerabilities on other architecture and see if I am affected. Because I'm, I'm not sure if IBM is going to phone like Intel any day. So I don't know. Generally, IBM processors are also affected. We know about the Power 8, uh, power for instance, nine. Power 9. Uh, I think both Power yeah. 8 Power 9. Um, and they also have uh, quite a heavy performance loss if you enable the mitigations. Um, but So we ordered uh, IBM machines, but uh, we didn't receive them so far, so we couldn't run any tests on, on them. Uh, but generally, most of our uh, experiments are written mostly in C code. You would have to replace maybe a few bits to adapt them to IBM. But generally, the attack approach should be very similar because the idea of the underlying architecture is so similar. And, well, thanks for the answer. I will do this and publish research. But um, I have another question. And one question, please. Okay. Only one. So uh, the very last one, because we have two minutes left. And I think the gentleman with the white coat, no, he doesn't want. So microphone number two is waving. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you showed a lot of new, new variants of the attack. And as we understand, it is not under embargo, right? So, uh, are the mitigations against them currently developed, or we are just waiting for proof of concept exploit? I mean, how many CPUs support MPK? Yeah, so the, 
they're not real um, mitigations being provided by, uh, by by the vendors, but they say it's basically yeah, it's so similar. Just fix your software so that you don't have ifs in your software, for example. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so it's more like um, users or developers should fix their software because you could write software for many of the variants in a way that they can't be exploited anymore with, of course, a performance impact and we don't have real patches yet for them. It's also a bit of risk management because where do you run untrusted code? Primarily in your browser and JavaScript and there we have site isolation um, and in other places. So we are disabling the STIBP patches by default now for, for most applications. Um, so we are turning the patches off because they cost too much performance and the risk is not so high currently. Probably this will change with the first um, real-world exploits and then people will say uh, enable the patches by default, but uh, that's how security works. Uh, we never care about security before something happens. Thanks. And with this words, we close this talk. A very warm applause for him. Yeah.